I'm Keith Reynolds, and I am here with Marketplace Live, and we are so excited to have you today joining us. I've got Tom Dempsey with me. Tom, welcome. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, as we continue this journey, I'm with Market Share Growth Advisors. Terrific. And Tom is the sales guy and I'm the marketing guy. And we talk sales, marketing and rock and roll here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Tom, it's it's great to see you and welcome to Julie Livingston. Hey, guys. Great to be here. Nice to see you. Nice to have you this morning. Uh, we're on LinkedIn Live where where we met and uh, and we're just carrying it forward to LinkedIn Live. So, Julie, um, we are I was a, a guest on your podcast last week and this week it's it's you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself and uh, welcome. Thanks so much again, Keith. Well, I'm a longtime publicist. I've worked inside the corporate sector for Scholastic, for the Toy Association, in uh, education marketing and more, and um, have led marketing communications teams as such. But I've also been an entrepreneur kind of concur concurrently. Um, this is my third time in an entrepreneurial venture, and I run Want Leverage Communications. It is a boutique size public relations and LinkedIn consultancy. And I do all the things that you would expect from a traditional PR agency, you know, providing strategic communications counsel, crisis communications when needed, um, placing my clients in media outlets that matter to them, whether that's B2B or B2C publications, um, booking speaking engagements, solidifying strategic partnerships and, and so on and so forth but I've developed an expertise on the LinkedIn platform. And that's where I help to raise executive visibility and credibility on LinkedIn. And this has been extremely successful and it really happened organically um, through the public relations work I have been doing. So tell me a little bit about how you've now arrived through all that experience to executive visibility and thought leadership and you know tell, tell us your journey that got you there and what's really your secret sauce well it's kind of it was kind of unexpected completely unexpected um about five years ago i was amping up my own presence on linkedin as a way to pound the pavement and find new you know identify new clients and put myself back on the radar i had been quiet for a while i had taken a corporate position for a short while um, when, the, when the economy was down. And I started you know, developing my own content, posting, I don't know, probably two to three days a week. And one day I got an email on LinkedIn, on the LinkedIn message platform. And it was from a colleague of mine who I hadn't talked to in probably a dozen years, maybe 10 years. And um, she reached out to me when I first met her 10 years before or so, she had been uh, director of corporate communications for a, an education technology startup. She had since changed jobs. She was now at a Fortune 50 company where she was a VP of com corporate communications and reported to a chief customer officer who oversees a huge field force of more than 40,000 people across the United States and North America. And that person was kind of flying under the radar. She's a female in a big technology company, which should make her somebody to really stand out, right? Because that's unusual. The technology field is kind of male dominated, but she really needed to increase her executive visibility and presence and on LinkedIn specifically. And so my colleague said, I knew just who to call because she had seen my content and she saw a lot of value in the content. Um, and she thought that I could do that for her. Well, Keith, I had no, I had, did not even think of this as, as a service that I could offer at all. I'm not sure why I just didn't because I was very, very strong at developing content for clients. And certainly when I held corporate positions, 
but she was my first client. We're now in the third year of this program, which has been enormously successful. And, um, so it really came as it came out of left field for me. I mean, I've I've increased her following starting at seventy five hundred to now more than twenty thousand. People across the company are engaging and talking to each other, and they're really thinking of this particular leader in a, a whole new way as somebody who's accessible, uh, who's not scary when they walk in the room, but somebody you could actually talk to and have a conversation with, and. Um, People from across the organization, you know, this is a huge organization. They are now actually conversing with each other, sharing photos, sharing stories on her LinkedIn feed. So it's been a phenomenal community building tool, has raised her credibility and visibility, as I said. That, that's a terrific example. Do, do, do you have an ideal uh, potential customer? Is, is, there, is there like a profile that you have that you think, boy, this is really going to be able to help this leader out? That's a great question, Tom. And I'm going to say it's generally a female leader. Could mm -hmm. be, she could be working in a male dominated industry. That's not to say I haven't worked for men, but I think that I have developed a strong specialty in working with other female executives. Um, she's working for a mid to large size company, could be in the Fortune 1000. Um, and she's kind of flying. Uh, below the radar a little bit. She Ooh. has been extremely successful. She is in the C-suite, um, but she's not as recognized as she probably should be within her organization and also outside of the organization. So when there are industry conferences, she's not necessarily speaking at them. She's not necessarily the first name you, you think of um, as a go-to individual for industry expertise. And in, internally, her name doesn't always pop up. Even though she's in the C-suite, her name doesn't pop up when there are new projects coming through. Um, and there's a little bit of a disconnect among that person's team. Perhaps they're not as cohesive. They're not working together as smoothly as they could. Perhaps they're not being as innovative as they could because there's a lack of that sense of community and connection. Uh, right, right. So you're you're helping obviously with with visibility, but you're helping a great deal with credibility too. There's no question about it that that uh, exec having a strong executive visibility program, especially in. Uh, can really ability, but it also creates this amazing sense of community. And that is so important for companies today, especially in a tight talent market. You know, and people can work anywhere in the world today, right? They don't, I mean, I'm based in New York, but I could be based in Nebraska. It wouldn't really matter today. Um, so how do you engage those people and make them feel connected to your brand and your company in the long term? So the LinkedIn work I do in, in raising executive visibility on the platform is also a wonderful talent attraction and talent retention tool. Mm, absolutely. That's a great point. You know, your story also uh, highlights the importance the importance of having an inbound mentality, right? That that the content you put out there, if you have content that's targeted to your ICP, that's dropped in a channel that you, you're, they hang out at, you increase the probability that somebody will reach out to you like somebody did to you three years ago. Totally, and, and absolutely. Be open to the opportunity. And you kind of have to trust the process. And I learned that I've been studying and working with HubSpot for 15 years. And the number of times that I've had business opportunities pop up by being active and, right. and staying out there with, with my ideas, um, they're going to resonate with somebody. And it's not. And it takes time. It takes time for that to happen, to build that audience and build that you know, build that presence on the platform. Absolutely, absolutely. To be able to, to, again, create that persona that you're trying to create that may not have existed before. So it's visibility, but again, it's targeted visibility. And it's probably, I would think, relatively unique to each client that you have. 
It definitely is because each client is coming to me. They're in a different, well, first of all, they're working for a different organization in a different culture. So they, you know, you, you could be starting on, on a variety of levels of, um, visibility, you know, how well they're known. I mean, I've done work, I did work for a CEO of a management consulting startup and she really didn't have as many followers to be, you know, to begin with. She was under, let's say the 7,500 uh, range, but she had a great story to tell about company culture. Mm. And we, we built her presence through exciting, compelling link LinkedIn content. And over time, she became a sought after subject matter expert on company culture, was, um, was sought out to do speaking engagements. She actually got one, got an inquiry from Toyota because of the visibility that she had had on the platform and also got started getting tons of resumes yeah. because, you know, by talking about company culture specifically, you know, uh, talking about how to create a positive company culture. Those are the organizations people naturally want to work for and be a part of. So she started using the platform and leveraging it to be a talent attraction tool oh, and a community building tool. Yes. Yes. And you bring up culture too, which is so important. And, you know, I've always heard it say, and I really believe in it, is that you can't perpetuate a culture unless you can define it. <laughs> and define that, it and be authentic about it you know be really authentic. believe in it that's right that's exactly right so you wrote about building a resilient culture can you give just a couple of snippets about that and building a a, a really strong culture whether it's a small cap company a medium cap or a fortune thousand company well i think the important thing in building a a, a positive company culture is for leaders to be authentic and honest in their communication. Um, they have to be seen as accessible, like real human beings, um, not somebody who sits in an office away from everyone. Um, and my clients who have done this successfully are the people who are the ones who are always walking around to see how people are and how they're doing and just to kind of converse with him with them. I have another client who used to sit in the in the um, outside area of her office suite so that she could actually sit next to um, all of the, her team members. And mm -hmm. that helped her to develop relationships and help them develop more of a sense of team and community. And trust too. And trust, that's absolutely. Great. Yeah, that's a great point. As we uh, wind into the next segment of the program, you know, we we have this thesis that sales and marketing need to work together like a rock and roll band does. And that many of the themes that happen within rock and roll and the band dynamic also uh, translate to things we can talk about for sales and marketing professionals today. Um, so with, with that in mind, have you seen any connectivity between the thought leadership and the generation of sales leads and companies you know making that connection i have um in the in the work that i've been doing to raise executive visibility specifically on linkedin but also in in garnering media placements for my clients we always have a plan on how to merchandise it um and how to really take the coverage that that they're getting and then apply it to their advertising marketing and public relations uh work that they do and so that all the messages are dovetailing and um are really working for them to build that cre outside and internal credibility so is that where the name want leverage comes from absolutely we help companies to <laughs> leverage their their brand their brand values so uh, I know you've got uh, some rock and roll stories planned. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your musical taste, your bands and- Sure. Getting... Well, I have, I would say I have kind of a diverse musical taste. Um, I, you can hear that I'm from, I'm a native New Yorker. And so you can imagine that just being here in this hub of music activity and, and culture that um, I do have a number of stories with, 
uh, you know, that I want to share today, I'm going to say that one of my favorite bands, um, cause I have a, a bunch would be counting crows. I really think that they have produced a number of absolutely perfect albums and I just love them. They still, after all these years, I, I get start dancing around and I just, I just, they really resonate with me on a very emotional level. Um, and my favorite song is Sullivan street, which you probably all know, but I, I really love them. And to, sh should I share some of my rock and roll stories? Keith? Yes. By all means. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I have two that I like to share. And one of them is, um, I have a cousin, a close cousin who, uh, was a very well-known rock and roll lawyer and, you know, lawyer for the who, for Billy Joel, for you two. And she had gotten my brother and I tickets to see the Rolling Stones one time at Madison Square Garden. And I was out of my mind crazy. I was so excited. I couldn't believe I was actually going. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she got us pretty good seats, kind of uh, toward more the side of the stage, but with full view. So just a little bit off center, um, center stage. And when we went in, we saw all of the disc jockeys from our favorite rock and roll radio station, which was then, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was WNEW FM 102.7, which had these legacy disc jockeys, you know. They were um, the founding of rock and roll. They really were. And so we were sitting near all these guys, it was, and women, and it was just like, just to even see them in person. But sitting right near us, maybe a row or two away, was Elizabeth Taylor and Michael Jackson. And wow. I. Wow. I, I <laughs> think about it now. I just, the emotion just rises in me. I could not believe my eyes. I kept thinking, I must be imagining this. Like this can't really be happening. And I don't even remember what happened at the rest of the concert because I was screaming. I was dancing. I was totally into it. Um, so that was one rock and roll story. And then the other one was um, I, I often like to go to shows and sometimes concerts by myself. It's where I do my best thinking. And so I was determined to see uh, Carly Simon at the bottom mm -hmm. line, which was is a famous club that used to be here in New York City's Greenwich Village. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's where so many acts got their start. And I was I grew up with all those singer songwriters of that mm -hmm. particular era in the 1970s and 80s. And I decided I was going to go, but it, you know, it was sold out. It was a very small place and um, less than a few hundred people. It, I don't even know if it fit 200 people. It was very small. And so I decided to go and I I waited online in the pouring rain. I mean, pouring all day for about five or six hours just to get on this line to see if maybe, maybe I would get standing room. And we finally went in. I remember I had mascara running down my face. I looked like a wet rat. <laughs> and I finally got, I got in. I was like the last person they lent in for standing room. And, wow. you know, I was going nuts. So when I went in, you know, just before the concert started, I had to go to the ladies room and kind of fix up what I looked like. And walking to the ladies room, I walked past Billy Joel and his wife at the time. And I walked past Diane Keaton and Warren Beatty. Ugh. And I think Art Garfunkel was there also. And I, again, I was like stunned because <laughs> you don't think they're real people. <laughs> and I'm just walking to the ladies room, just, you know, passing them all by. It was unbelievable to me. Just unbelievable. Boy, that's a great story. And right out of the heart of rock and roll, that's where what James Taylor and Carol King and he were, well, actually those... James Taylor was there, um, but he was backstage. He came out and sang Mockingbird with her. Wow. Because oh. that's when they, they were married awesome. at the time. It was 1968. Yeah. So to tie those two together, did you know that uh, Mick Jagger sings backup on your so vain? I do. I do. It's awesome. That's right. Uh, and actually, you know, story. recently Taylor Swift was asked what her favorite song was of all time. And she said, it's You're So Vain. That's a great song. Okay, yeah. so here's the big question is, do we know who it was about? She'll never say. That, that's, that was my understanding is that she'll never. And I love, you know, I love song. that about, about that story because she's somebody who's owning her story, right? She's owning right. the song that she wrote 
and she is never going to divulge who it's actually about. Some think it was about Mick Jagger or Warren Beatty. Right. Um, who and she dated both of them at, at some point briefly. And she's kept to that. You know, she's really stayed kind of on brand by, mm -hmm. by keeping to that and not divulging it. And that has continued even like 40 years later, continued the mystique around that particular song. Interesting. Wow. And is, isn't it ironic that both of them probably think it's about them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be disappointed if it wasn't, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Well, we, we got tickets this summer and I'll probably do an episode or two from the road this year. Uh, we're seeing the Rolling Stones in Denver, Phoenix and Chicago. And then Ooh. in August, we're seeing uh, yeah. Willie Nelson, Billy Strings, and oh, who's the other one? Willie Nelson, Billy Strings. Ah, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, we're going to try and take this on the road and go see some rock and roll this summer. Oh, my God. How fun yeah. is that going to be? Well, I am very envious of that. I didn't even try getting Stones tickets. I kind of gave up, but <laughs> we're 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 gonna we're gonna start in May too. We'll be at the Sphere in Vegas for Dead and Company. Oh, which will be are they doing a residency? I have friends going for that. Is that right? Residency. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, yes. So we'll have an episode from the. Actually, I'll stand outside the Sphere. That should have that should be a phenomenal experience, Tom. I, I know somebody yeah. who's gone to see you two at the Sphere three times. Wow! Yeah, no. we've had two guests on that say that their favorite band was Aerosmith, and one of them saw Aerosmith out there. I'm I'm not sure if it was in the Sphere, but they were doing a residency yeah. in Vegas. Wow! Uh, I love well, the uh, I love that the two people brought on. Uh, Aerosmith is their favorite bands and they were talking about it from the 1990s and when they said it I had all these memories from the 1970s <laughs> absolutely right. of course right so rock and roll is enduring we found it just such a great way to wrap these up we do these podcasts to demonstrate the podcast ecosystem that we've developed and Julie you were very generous and had me on your show to to describe that but it's really about what do you do with the podcast after you do the podcast absolutely so we look forward to sharing your material your thought leadership here it was really an honor to have you on the show thank you so much i really enjoyed our conversation and i love going back and think rethinking about those rock and roll stories yeah who doesn't that that's what we all have in common everybody's got a story an experience a memory something fun and again, we, yeah. uh, Keith and I, really try to tie it into sales and marketing because there's clearly a, uh, a thread that that weaves its way through sales and marketing through, and and culture, right? I mean, culture of bands. Oh my God! I mean, the, you're seeing the Stones the this summer. Yeah, I think the Stones are probably you know, the so Stones you know and the, the Dead probably in terms of branding. Unbelievable. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. There, there are books there are books written about that, about branding of Grateful Dead or branding of the Stones. And it's fascinating and marketing. So anyway, that's a topic for another time. We were so happy to have you on. Thank you again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Keith. Our pleasure. Okay. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Marketplace Live. Keith, cheers. I don't have a <laughs> glass. Through the magic of of uh, technology, Tom and I are sitting miles apart in the same room <laughs> and hosting each other. All right, it's, Julie, it's this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, everybody, for joining us Marketplace Live. Have a All great right. day. Take care.